Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Real Talks. I'm your host, David Steele. Um, I hope everybody had a fabulous weekend and uh, enjoyed themselves and maybe went to the movies to see the new uh, film that just came out. Um, so that was interesting, to say the least. <laughs> um, and, and guys, if you want to check out the spoiler cast I did with Matthew Anderson, it is up on the channel right now. Um, I am continually putting brand new uh, podcasts up. So, guys, if you don't have the time, if you're running errands or whatever, but you still want to listen, go check out your favorite podcasting sites, whether it's Spotify, iHeart, you know, Apple, and subscribe to the channel, leave me a review, and I'll definitely put you on the channel. I'll tell everybody about you. But more importantly, as I go through, I'm going to be putting up more and more and more shows along with spoiler casts and everything else. So today, my goal is to get a few more done, okay? And the three that I'm really going to be focusing on, okay, I just put up the air spoiler cast the other day. The ones I'm going to be really focusing on are Cree 3, Guardians of the Galaxy, and of course, Fast X1. And so um, if you're out and about the gym running errands, you can just listen to it rather than watch it. So, you know, we, we that's going on. We got a bunch of stuff going on today. Really interesting stuff. Um, and something off the top. And so I'm going to something, start with something off the top, top today. This has been my most anticipated movie for since I can remember recalling it was going to be released. And we finally had a release date. And... Um, it's one of those things where um, I think it's going to be the biggest movie this summer. I think it's going to be huge. And I think that, you know, it, it's just going to really knock everybody's socks off. You know, I'm talking about Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning. This movie is just going to break the bank. I, you know, and I know everybody's, well, you've got Guardians, you've got the Flash. I know that. I'm, I, you know, I am. So my argument to that would be this. Number one, you have, and we're, we're going to be getting into a story a little bit later on, and this is going to prove my point. But you have a star in Tom Cruise that is bonafide. I mean, he, you see the name Tom Cruise in the foyer, in the banner, your butt is in the seat, no matter what it is, whether it's Edge of Tomorrow, whether it's War of the Worlds, whether it's Mission Impossible, whether it's, you know, Jerry Maguire even. So this is the last Mission Impossible film, part one, since everybody is looking to actually, you know, do certain parts now. Um, we just got a, a brand new trailer a couple days ago, you know, and that was released. Um, look. Like I said, I love this. I, I, as a matter of fact, guys, go check out. Speaking of it, I'll put it up there in the little corner there. Go check out. I will be. I am doing a mission. Re, mission Impossible rewatch series as we speak. I've gotten through this two of them. I'll be doing the third one momentarily. I will have all of them watched and recorded for you guys by July twelfth. So that way, you'll get all of my thoughts. You'll get all the opinions, and you'll be able to walk into Dead Reckoning. And just enjoy yourself. Now, it's so every now and then we get celebrities or directors in this case to drop little photographs. So we have finally put part of the puzzle of this together. And by the way, that's an awesome poster. But we have finally put some of these the pieces of the puzzle together. So everybody knows that, and it's been seen, that this has been the shot that in the first trailer that Tom Cruise was holding this key. We don't know what it is. We don't know where it goes until now. So last night, Christopher McQuarrie dropped this picture. So this is, we don't know what's behind the door. We don't know if it's even a door. We, we, we think it's a door. I mean, I think it's a door. It's got a lock, you know, but it's not even, so it's not even a door because it doesn't have a handle, but it is a lock. 
And we can clearly see that this lock, okay, matches that key. So whatever is behind this is what Tom has in his hand. That is, so what the key here, and so this thing here is what's called a MacGuffin, okay? This is movie terms, but it's called a MacGuffin, okay? And a MacGuffin, okay, is something that both the po protagonist and the antagonist are going after. So, for example, let's say Mission Impossible, okay? They're both going after the key, okay? Um, let's say Raiders of the Lost Ark. Both of them are going to go, you know, the antagonist and the pro protagonist and antagonist are going after the, the Ark. Um, Avengers Infinity, Infinity War. They're both going after, or one is trying to protect in this case, one is trying to protect the stones because Thanos is. So those are MacGuffins. So this key here, okay, as far as we know, okay, and it could be, it could be, there could be more. I mean, it is only the first film. So there could be another MacGuffin we're not knowing about. My guess is there is going to be one because whatever is behind that lock is going to be extremely, extremely valuable. So I found it fascinating, though, that we're starting to, you know, we're only, you know, like six weeks back of this. And, you know, so we finally get, like I said, we finally get the piece of the puzzle. So Christopher McCory dropped this on his Instagram last night. And as you can see, like I said before, that key fits into that lock. We don't know what's behind it. We don't know if it's a door. We don't know if it's a case. We don't know what it is. So the pieces are slowly, slowly starting to come together. And I, I you know, guys, I, I've been championing this film all along. I think this is going to be fabulous. I think this is... You know, I was kidding with somebody the other day. I said, I think the way they should end it, as corny as it may sound, is that last jump, okay, when he he's going, and this is that poster, this is that promotional poster, you know, we, I was just talking about where he takes off. I said, wouldn't be awesome if that's where it ended? I mean, you want to talk about a literal cliffhanger, that would be it. Um and I think that, you know, regardless of what happens, you know, we don't know. I mean, is Ethan going to survive? Probably, more than likely. But we don't know. He may die in the second part. We don't even know that. Anyways, what did you guys think about the photograph from McQuarrie? What do you think is in there? Is it a case? Is it behind some a door? What do you think is there, and how do you think it's going to be uh, gotten, for lack of a better word? Uh, are you guys excited about Mission Possible? Do you want to see this, or are you going to wait on it? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments, and I'll get back to everybody. Okay, so as we move from one story to another, one blockbuster to another. So everybody knows there was a little film that just came out this week. And I'm talking about Fast X. Fast X was this monster blockbuster. Um, and the thing is that this is just taking everybody in the whole world by storm. Um, that being said, it made a lot of money. It made a lot of money this weekend. Um, so as a matter of fact, guys, go back. And I know I keep reiterating myself, but go back and check out the um, spoiler cast I did with Matthew Anderson. And so this comes to us from the Hollywood Reporter. And... It talks about Fast 10 zooms into 
zooms into theaters making 67 and a half million, which by the way, went up. Okay. This is why we have estimates and then we have final numbers and 319 million globally. Universal's Fast 10 racing to a North American debut to 67 and a half million in a rousing 318 million point nine. So call it, let's call it 319. 319 million uh, globally as the core franchise winds down. That's a promising start for the 10th installment for e if even if the movie is seeing lower returns in the United States. Things are different overseas, where Fast 10 cleared a huge 251.4 million in its international debut. Its global opening marks it the number two debut behind fellow Universal's The Super Mario Brothers, which made 377 million. Internationally, it is the top opening of 2023 so far. The action pick easily wrestled the box office crown away from Marvel's and Disney's Guardians of the Galaxy 3, which is now in th its third week. Guardians 3, which is no slouch, earned another $32 million domestically and $48.8 million overseas for a, a pleasing total of $659.1 million. Um, Fast X is one of the few is one of the few recent Hollywood films to resonate in China, where it opened to an impressive 78.3 million. That is an impressive opening for China. Uh, other territory highlights, it took a sizable 16.7 million in Mexico, followed by France 9.7, Brazil 9.6, India 8.6, Indonesia 8.4, Germany 8, the UK 7.6, South Korea, uh, 6.7, and it scored a franchise best, 7 million in China. In North America, Fast X received a B plus cinema score from the audience, the same grade given to the Fast 9, the Fast Saga picture win, which debuted domestically to $70 million in 2021, when the pandemic still posed a major challenge to the box office. That compares to a franchise best domestic. 148 million for Fast 7 in 2015, followed by 98 million for The Fate of the Furious in 2015, and 97 million for Fate, Fast and Furious 6 in 2013, and that's not adjusted for inflation. Louis Leder directed the 10th installments in the popular franchise, and he's also on board for the 11th. What the while that film is the final installment in Universal's main Fast series, there's plenty of opportunities for spinoffs. Vin Diesel leads a huge cast of familiar faces in Fast X, including franchise mainstays Michelle Rodriguez, Tyrese Gibson, Ludacris, Sung Kang, and Eugenia Brewster. Newcomers include Jason Momoa, Brie Larson, Rita Morano, and Rita Morano, who plays with Diesel's grandma. Nathaniel M uh, Emmanuel, Emmanuel, John Zena, Jason Stratham, Alan Richardson, Daniel McKella, Scott Eastwood, Helen Mirren, and Charlize their own also star. Over the course of the many fast films, Dom Toretto and his family have outsmarted and outnerved and outdriven every phone in their path. Now they must confront their most lethal opponent they've ever faced, a terrifying villain in Mimosa, emerging from the shadows of the past, who's fueled by blood revenge and determined to shatter the family once and for all and destroy everything that Dom loves. Universal and Illuminations blockbuster Super Mario plays third with, domestically with $9.8 million. Globally, it's cleared another milestone as it's past the Incredibles, $1.243 billion, to rank as the third biggest animation animated film of all time with $1.248 billion in worldwide sales, not adjusted for inflation. Focus has filmed the book, book club, The Next Chapter, which is meant for the older females, fell off a steep 57% in sophomore outing to 3 million for a domestic total of 13.1 million. And the sequel uh, came in, Evil Dead Rise came in number four, rounding out the top five in its fifth week with 2.4 million. Overseas, the Warner Brothers Pictures has earned another 3.4 million for an impressive tally, foreign tally of 77 million and 141 and a half globally. Okay, let's talk about this, guys. Because 
this is something that's just it's a phenomenon fast 10 has been around or i shouldn't say fast 10 the franchise itself has been around for 21 22 years okay this started all the way back in 2001 and they were really really good and props to matthew anderson because you know we just had him on the show the other day and i know i keep reiterating but he sat down and he watched every single film now he didn't like some and compared to others and i gotta be honest like i stopped after fast five i checked out <laughs> it just got too out of just too crazy i could suspend a disbelief but th this was just like wow so i had not seen any of the films prior to fast 10. i had you know Fast 7, Fast 8, fast, I didn't see any of those. I knew that they had brought back uh, Han. Okay, that was that whole hashtag, justice for Han, whatever. Okay. I, you know, overall, the movie, I, I, I said this in a tweet I put out the other day. By the way, guys, if you want to follow me on Twitter, that is my handle down there in the bottom left-hand corner. Go follow me there. I'm always on Twitter talking about movies, tweeting about movies, you know, everything about movies in spaces, hosting spaces about movies. So go check that out. Um, so, you know, it's one of those things where, um, yeah, I, I basically, I checked out after Fast Five. But I got to say, okay, this movie was one of some of the craziest action I have ever seen in my life. Um, it tried to be too funny, if you can even believe that. Some of the gags worked. And I'm not, and you guys, I'm not going to give anything away, but if you want to go check it out, you can, you know, anybody who's seen the film knows what I'm talking about. Some of the gags worked and others did not. That being said, uh, this isn't a bad opening. Considering the excuse me, considering the the budget of this movie, this isn't bad. Now, it's going to have to make its money up overseas. There is no doubt about that, okay? Because this, you know, it's going to have one more week, okay? I mean, Little Mermaid is going to, you know, be doing some business, but that's for a different demographic. Uh, if, if this movie holds strong, it will make anywhere between 35 to 40 million. But people are going back to that because they want to have a good time. Do not go the, to this movie. <laughs> and that's the other thing about this, this franchise is it knows what it is, right? It knows what it is, whether it's cars jumping out of buildings, whether it's, you know, them, you know, dragging safes ac across the uh, Rio de Janeiro, whatever. It knows what it is. It's an action franchise. There were a lot of problems with this movie. Okay. Not a lot. There were some problems. One thing, and uh, we'll, I'll talk about the box office in a minute. One of the big things about this movie was there was way too many people in this movie. I mean, now, the, there are comparisons out there to Infinity War, and I get that. I would do it, I would compare it to fin Infinity War myself, but with one caveat. There was story behind Infinity War. There were stakes behind Infinity War. There are no stakes here. Okay. Um, but I had a good time. And that's and that's one of the main things why you go to the movies is to have a good time. Right? So as far as box office is concerned, it did really well. It did really, really well. And I think that. That all being said, um, it's going to, you know, it's going to do well next week, I think. Um, I mean, depending on, you know, it, it always amazed me because, I mean, you take a look at something like Guardians, for example, that still made $32 million. Think about that for a minute. That made $32 million. That, that's incredible. And there are, 
I mean, you want to talk about a movie that has legs. It is unbelievable. So, I mean, even Super Mario. Super Mario made a good amount of money, and it's in his sixth week. Um, I think at the end of the day, okay, we are all just like, you know, chopping at the bit is not the right term, but it's one of those things where I think we're all just waiting, right? I think we're all just waiting for um, June. Because I honestly, you know, this movie it was good. I mean, not good. It had its problems. It was fun. It was bombastic. It was wild. Um, I can only imagine. I can only imagine what the next film's going to be. And, and I have a couple of ideas. And, guys, I'm not going to spoil. As I said, I'm not going to spoil anything for you. Go check out the spoiler cast. The um, the post credit scene. So the post credit scene there actually was fascinating, and I think that. Sorry guys, the the stream just seemed to. There we go. Sorry about that. The stream just kind of glitched, um, but nonetheless, the post credit scene was interesting. And I think that it's going to be fascinating to see how they incorporate everybody back into this. So, but overall, it was, it was a good opening weekend for it. Um, if this makes, I'll be honest, if this makes $200 million domestic, this is a win. It's a win for Universal. It really is. Because, you know, and look, I, I get COVID-related things and everything else, but when you look at the budget compared to what it is, this is the kind of movie that you're looking for this to be front-loaded, right? I think everybody would have agreed that this could have been a $100 million movie. So, anyways, guys, what do you think about Fast X? Did you, have you seen Fast X? If so, did you enjoy it? Would you go back and see it again in the theaters? And where does it rank overall in your Fast and Furious rankings? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments, and I'll get back to everybody. Okay, so we go from a blockbuster to a film that is most is going to be highly, highly anticipated for um, the rest of the year. And I'm talking about Killers of the Flower Moon. This is one of those, um, this is one of those movies that, you know, what I will say is this. I think that I, first of all, I'm looking forward to this moment. There's no doubt in my mind about this. Okay. Moreover than that, what I'll say is this, that we, and I say we, I mean the audience as far as the movie got going audience, whether you go at, you know, once a month or once a week, we have to start to appreciate things before we lose them. And, you know, my good friend on, on Twitter, um, we just, you know, he, we have, by the way, Skadoosh is his screen name. Go check him out. He does spaces quite frequently on all these different topics. And last night, because it was, you know, it was screened the other day, we did a top five Martin Scorsese, um, you know, ranking. Now, if you can't find the screen name, just follow me and then, you know, look at my followers and you'll find them there. Uh, that being said, Scorsese, I put him in the top five, top four. He's in my, my Mount Everest as far as pictures, as far as directors. Okay. I think it's going to be Spielberg. 
it's going to be Scorsese. It's going to be, you know, Coppola. And then it's probably going to be Cameron. Okay. Because those four men, three of those four men grew up in a different, all together. Okay. I mean, you have the big four. I mean, you've got Lucas, Coppola, Scorsese, and Spielberg. They've changed cinema for the past 50 years. There's no doubt about it. Whether you're talking about movies like Raiders of the Lost Ark or E.T. or Schindler's List or Taxi Driver or Goodfellas or Casino or Wolf of Wall Street or The Godfather, Dracula, whatever it is, they've completely changed cinema. And Scorsese's not spring chicken anymore. He's in his 80s now. And his last film, The Irishman, which I still have to sit down and watch, is one of those things where I have no doubt it was. His, his seventh best film could be a whole career for somebody. It's that simple. I mean, whether it's Taxi Driver, whether it's Raging Bull, whether it's Wolf of Wall Street, whether it's Killers of the Flower Moon, even though that hasn't been screened yet, whether it's The Irishman, okay? I love The Color of Money myself. I think it's an underrated movie. All of that being said, this is going to be an event. When this comes to the theaters in at the end of the year, this is going to be an event. Okay. The reason I bring this up, guys, is because um, at Cairns, okay, the Osage tribal chief says... Martin Scorsese and Leonardo DiCaprio have, quote, restored trust with Killers of the Flower Moon. And this comes from THR. Martin Scorsese got perhaps the most glowing endorsement of his latest film, The Killers of the Flower Moon, at Cannes Film, Cannes film Festival. The Apple original feature starring Leonardo DiCaprio, Robert De Niro, and Lily Gladstone, whose picture's there. And by the way, her story is amazing, too. She actually almost quit acting before she got a phone call from Martin Scorsese, but that's for another time. Explores a series of murders of members in the oil-rich, indigenous Osage nation in the 1920s, unraveling the betrayal the community faced by white outsiders and the FBI investigation that brought the killers into light. Speaking at the press conference for the film on Sunday, Chief Standing Beer, leader of the Osage nation, said his people still suffer with the still suffer with it to this day. I can say on behalf of the Osage Nation that Scorsese and his team have restored trust, he said. The previous evening, the Apple film bowed to an enthusiastic reception in the Palace, the Palace, excuse me for the mispronunciation there, the, the audience rising for a standing ovation lasting nine minutes among the lazy excuse me, among the lengthiest of the film festival so far. Scorsese spoke on how deeply his feelings of the uh, tribal leaders impact his, his creative process. I knew when I had heard what their values are about love, respect, and loving the earth. And I'm not talking about making this place, and I'm not talking about making this into a political issue. I'm talking about how to really live on this planet. It, re, it reoriented me every time I heard it, Scorsese said. I wanted to know everything I could about the Osage. It's overwhelming. The more I found out, the more I wanted to put in. Standing there added there were younger Osage working behind the camera on the film across various departments and also expressed his admiration regarding the work ethic of the top cast. The specter of Donald Trump also made an unlikely appearance in the press conference. The former president and potential 2024 election candidate was referred to by Robert De Niro who drew parallels between the political figure and the character he plays in Killers, a man who pretends to be an ally of the oil-rich Osage nation in the 1920s, only to betray them over a series of brutal murders in his quest for wealth. We see it today, and you know who I'm talking about, and I'm not going to say his name, De Niro said. That guy is stupid. It's fair, and we have to keep a very close eye on it, De Niro added, referring to the evil lurking in everyday white supremacy. He went on, there are people who think Trump can do a good job. Imagine how insane that is. Reflecting on, hap on happier thoughts, De Niro noted that the last time he was at the festival with Scorsese was with Taxi Driver back in 1976. Taxi Driver, of course, would win the Palme d'Or. So let's talk about that. 
this looks so we finally finally got the trailer for this so it was shown at CinemaCon, and we finally got the trailer for this and i gotta say guys it looks awesome it looks awesome i cannot wait for this movie and if so let me dive into the thoughts real quick because the fact that Scorsese was actually able to regain their trust and restore trust is huge because, you know, this is a story that I don't think anybody else could have told. I don't. Okay. I think that, you know, he was the right person to do it because of his, of the stories he tells. He tells hard, Scorsese tells hard hitting stories. Okay. Okay. These aren't your your one of the mill stories. I mean, he tells a good fellas. That's a mob movie. That's a hard mob movie. Okay, that's a hard R. Casino, hard R. The Departed, hard R. I don't think you could have gotten somebody to have done it um, any lighter. This is this is a deep, touching film. And they needed somebody to do that. And I think Mark Scorsese was the right one. Now, where this ends up in the grand scheme of things, I mean, those films I just named you are probably in everybody's top five. Okay. Um, that being said, this is going to go down as one of the best films. Definitely in his top ten, I think. You know. Now, I, truth be told, I haven't seen all of his filmography. I want to go back and watch. I have seen Raging Bull. Amazing. And the reason for that is... It was in black and white. That was a very young Robert De Niro and a very young Joe Pesci. And you look at their filmography and how they've worked together, whether it is The Irishman, whether it is Casino, whether it is, you know, Goodfellas. It's not, well, I'm sorry, not not Goodfellas, but um, I'm blanking on it. Anyways, the, po the point is they've worked together all the time. And they're really good. This looks, De Niro... <laughs> And the other thing I'll say about Scorsese is this. He's taken two of his muse. I mean, we're going to call them muses. But two of his favorite actors over the course of his career. You look at the number of films that he's done with Robert De Niro. And you look at the number of films he's done with Leonardo DiCaprio. I'm talking about Shutter Island. I'm talking about Wolf of Wall Street. I'm talking about now Killers of the Flower Moon. I'm talking about The Aviator. And then you take a look at somebody like De Niro. That he's worked with, Raging Bull, Casino, Goodfellas, The Irishman. This has all the makings of cleaning up. Now, truth be told, we don't know what else is going to be coming out. There are a lot of good pictures coming out this summer, in this in this fall season. Okay, a lot. One that I hope really does well, and we'll talk about that at another time. But yeah so this i think is going to be fabulous the fact that he was able to restore their trust and you had the younger generation that that's that cannot be lost here the younger generation was actually working on the set that's how much love they had for this otherwise they would have just washed their hands and said okay you make your picture the fact that they sat they had the younger generation in there working on the film and you're going to have all of those um all of those younger generation okay these teenagers and young adults they're going to grow up hopefully they're going to grow up grow up and, and make films and that's what we need we need good stories so i think this is going to be fabulous look out for this and this is going to make and the thing is, this is going to make a whole lot of money. When we talk about this at the end of the year, this is not going to be making oodles and oodles like Guardians. Scorsese makes pictures because he likes the content. He's like a Clint Eastwood. He doesn't make it to make his money, okay? I mean, it's already a legend. He makes it because he wants to tell stories, okay? And that's what this is. He's telling another rich story anyways guys what do you think about kills of the flower moon 
What do you think about the tribal leaders coming out and basically saying you've restored our trust? Are you going to go see this in the theaters or are you going to go wait until this comes to Apple? Leave me your thoughts down in the comments and I will get back to everybody. Okay, so we move from one um, we move from one thing to the other. And so I'm going to just put these pictures up here. So we have, when I say we, I'm, when I always say we guys, I'm referencing the audience as far as um, a whole. So we have had a lot of great action heroes over the course of the last, I would say, 30, 40 years. But we're starting to get to that point where there aren't that many A-listers anymore. I mean, back in the day, you had, you know, and you probably just saw the picture. You had Sylvester Stallone. You had Arnold Schwarzenegger. You had Bruce Willis. You had Harrison Ford. You don't really have that anymore. We've got a couple of guys. I mean, hell, even Liam Neeson, you know, taken for, <laughs> let's call a spade a spade for a minute. Taken, resurrected Liam Neeson's career. If you take a look at what his filmography is after Taken, he did a boatload of action pictures. Whether it is, you know, and by the way, that was a franchise for him. Taken, Taken 2, Taken 3, The Commuter, The Gray, Run, Run at Night, Run All Night. He did a lot of pictures. So, but beyond that, I, I would even call the A-Team an action picture, okay? Which I loved. All that being said, I think that, you know, we are starting to, um, we don't have any A-listers anymore. So Harrison Ford, and we're going to stick with the whole Cannes Film Festival thing. So Harrison Ford, of course, was at Cannes for the premiere of Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. And so this comes to us from um, Variety. And basically, this talks about how the article is entitled, We Used to Treat Movie Stars Like Gods. Hollywood Grapples with the Loss of Young Star Power. The hottest package at this year's Cannes Film Festival stars a 76-year-old action star in a reboot of a movie that first dazzled moviegoers in 1993. That's a time, in case you forgot, before TikTok smartphones, Facebook, or Amazon, or any number of the technological changes that have reshaped our world and movie business along with them. And yet Cliffhanger, with Sylvester Stallone, uh, bravely mounting the, bravely mounting, uh, the summit, is seen as one of the most commercial scripts out there that buyers were hoping to make an adventure film that could traverse borders and bring crowds in. With a nod to young, the younger audience who will be needed to turn it up if the movie is going to replicate the original blockbuster status, the producers tease that the casting is currently underway for presumably a younger actor, presumably a younger actor to share the screen with Sly. But who will that be? Over the last 10 years, we've done a really shitty job of creating a new generation of movie stars, said one sales agent. And a look at some of the the projects that are premiering on Cannes seems to boast of that argument. There's Breakout, okay, starring a 75-year-old Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, that will be directed by Expendables filmmakers Scott Wall. Lord of War, starring a 59-year-old Nicolas Cage. Um, returning to a role as an Armin during as he first played nearly two decades ago. Now, by the way, that picture I'm showing you guys right now is from Face Off. That's Amora, a rom com with a 69 year old John Travolta and the rivals of the Amazon King, a crime story featuring a 53 year old Matthew McConaughey. In most case, and in most cases, these actors have been famous globally. So, since the 70s or 80s, McConaughey, a relatively newbie, had had to wait till '96 from a uh, he made his mark on the time to kill. On Thursday night, the increasingly 
generic nature of the star system was on full display as the Cannes Film Festival hosted a Harrison Ford's red carpet for Indiana Jones in the Dial of Destiny. Um, and this was one of the first times he walked the red carpet from the since the premiere of, in, of course, Raiders of the Lost Ark back in 1981. And it's still well preserved enough to be unbashedly doff off the top. I've been blessed with this body, he said sheepishly when asked about the shirtless scene at a press conference. Ford does get an assist from some of the key technological breakthroughs, appearing 35 years younger in key scenes thanks to the magic of de-aging CGI. So why hasn't there been a flowering A-lister to rival the Fords, Schwarzeneggers, and Stallone of yesterday? Protagonist pi picture COO George Hamilton points to the collapse of the DVD business in 2008 as the moment when Hollywood stopped being able to make reliable movie stars. Nearly all of the actors and actresses who are bankable now have very successful films when DVD and videos were a huge force, said Hamilton. We sell several films at the film festival, including Polly Finley's debut feature, Midwinter, Midwinter Break, starring Leslie Mansville. And that's just one of them. So you can see that there's a dividing shift in terms of all during new generation. With the new generation, there's more divisions between success because you can have the most watched show on a film on a streamer. But there's still a whole new swath of society who may not subscribe or and be a part of that. In 2008, just as DVD sales began in its death spiral, the first Twilight movie debuted, and the franchise's next-gen stars became the centerpiece of the market packages for years to come. But nearly as all those packages ultimately fizzled in the marketplace, today only Robert Patterson, who's 37, could carry a big-budget pick package to the goal line on his name alone uh, at a market like Cannes, because of the combination of his box office credentials, Batman, and critically acclaimed indie films such as Good Time. Kristen Stewart has earned critical raves in such film as Spencer, but has mo basically mo focused on smaller films instead of the tent films. By the way, one of the films I really enjoyed her in was Charlie's Angels. That, I mean, that's not, that's not a film that everybody really likes, but I love Charlie's Angels. The new iteration of it, by Elizabeth Banks was awesome. I loved her in that. So um, the promising, the most promising members of the up and coming A-listers. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. The most uh, promising member of the up and coming A-listers set to, uh, often to need check, to check multiple boxes, like a Sydney Sweeney, who's 25, who boasts not one, but two talked about series in the White Lotus and Euphoria, as well as the superhero cred featuring her starring upcoming role in Madam Web, a spin-off of Sony's Spider-Man franchise. Um, meanwhile, the sales agents think that some of the shrinking movie star phenomenon has to do with the long-term contracts of the rising stars, such as Tom Holland Chris Hel and Chris Helmworth, and have appeared in Marvel movies. Others, such as Ryan Gosling, who's 42, have been inconsistent in the global box office, despite commanding passion followings while Timothy Chalamet scored with Dune, but remains somewhat of an untried commodity. I think when Wonka comes out, we're going to see if that if he can really carry another picture like that. Michael B. Jordan, who's 36, has two franchises under his belt, Black Panther and Creed, but remains to be seen whether he can carry a film without a well-known IP. Likewise, Jennifer Lawrence will have a huge test when regarding her bankability with the new rated R comedy, No Hard Feelings. Post Hunger Games, she was a huge draw, but she has never she has been active and on the screen in recent years. The agent believes that the streaming services don't know how to apply the right amount of bar and show promising talents, in part because the movie, movies that debut on Netflix or Prime Video don't have the kind of massive, massive global campaign that accompanies major theatrical releases. We used to treat movies like gods, he said. The marketing of the streaming films is so limited that it really limits, that it really creates stars. Actors aren't burned in the minds like they once were, and they don't have this larger-than-life image anymore. Okay, let's talk about this. Because there are a lot of things to say. He said a lot of things here. Number one. <clears throat> He's right. I mean, let's just call a spade a spade. 
he's absolutely right when he says all these things. There are no more. And I, this is what I was saying the other day. The fact is, okay, we don't have any more movie stars today. There are no more movie stars. Tom Cruise is the last movie star we have today. It is not Sylvester Stallone. It is not Arnold Schwarzenegger. He is 76 and he's close to 70. Okay. And, you know, he, don't get me wrong. He was, the thing about Stallone is, look, he, he's done 20, 30, 40 films. And they were all incredible. Well, maybe not all incredible, but they were a good part. Whether it's Rocky or The Expendables, okay, or in the Creed franchise. He did very well. But he's not that same guy anymore. He just isn't. Okay? He was a physical, physical guy. You know, hell, I forgot about Rambo. Okay? Arnold. He's 76 years old. He's not that same guy from 1982 playing Conan the Barbarian. Okay? Or, you know, the Terminator in 1986. Or, you know... True Lies, 10 years later, in 1996. We don't have the only bankable, bankable, butts in your seat type of person is Tom Cruise. And when he can come out with a movie such like a Top Gun Maverick, okay, and I know the pandemic had some a lot to do with it. I, I'm not saying that. But that was one of the few movies that saved literally the box office in the in the theater system because otherwise we're not talking about that and this is why i keep harping on it all the time this is why mission impossible is going to be so big but he's the only one that can do this he's 62 years i think 61 years old i mean what other 61 year old do you i mean liam neeson's out of the game Let, let's just call a spade a spade Liam Neeson is out of the game, okay? We don't have guys like, you know, Travolta and Cage anymore, okay? I mean, they had their fun. You know, him with Con Air, The Rock, he had, you know, Face Off. So this is not, we don't have any more movie stars, okay? The, there are no names out there that go, I want to see that, even if it's bad. I think we really have to get and figure out who the next generation is going to be. Is it going to be a team? I would love, okay, I would love to see Timothy Chalamet do an action movie. That would be fantastic. But he's not that kind of actor. He's doing movies like Dune and Wonka and everything else. Patterson, who's 36 years old, okay, made his bones with Twilight did a lot of you know small little indie films because he never wanted to be known as the Twilight guy. And then he gets cast in The Batman, which was a good movie. Okay? It was a really good movie. But let's face it, it wasn't because of Patterson. Okay? He had something to do with it. Um, It was because it was a different Batman. This wasn't a old and, and grumpy Batman or a chiseled Batman. This was a young, year two Batman, and Matt Reeves did a phenomenal job with that. Coupled with the villain in, in the Joker, in, in the Riddler. Okay? So, you know, we'll see where this goes. But there are no more, more action. There are no more movie stars anymore. And, you know, Everybody loves Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford has had a career that I think most actors would dream about. Okay? They would dream about his career. Okay? He really got his start in 1977 with Star Wars. He dominated 15 years at the box office. Dominated. From 1977, then you go to, you know, 1980 with um, Empire. Okay, which, by the way, I couldn't believe it. Just turned 40 the other day. Guys, if you want to go back and watch for the perfect movies, I put it on the Twitter feed, but you actually guys can go back and watch it in the 
on the video. I sat down with Matthew Anderson and we talked all about why I believe and he believes Empire Strikes Back is a perfect movie. But he does Empire in 1980. Okay. He does Raiders of the Lost Ark in 81. He does Jedi in 83. He does Indiana Jones and Temple of Doom in 84. Okay. He does, you know, a couple of other films. He does Blade Runner, 85 or 86. He even goes out and does, you know, expands his range in 88 and does Witness, okay, or 89. 88 is Witness. 89 is Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Going to the 90s, early 90s, he does Regarding Henry, okay? He does Patriot Games in 92 or 93. He does clear and present. I he does Air Force One. Stop it! If you, it's it's getting bored. Okay. He does clear and present danger in ninety six, and that was his run. That was his fifteen year run of being made man. I still remember to this day one of those theater experiences you have. I went to go see Air Force One in the theater, and you know. Of course, everybody knows the ending of it where he says, get off my plane. That whole audience just cheered. Was It just rose up. Some of them were right and cheering. That's what kind of effect he had on, on cinema. But we don't have that anymore. There's only one guy that can do that, and that's Tom Cruise. And it's going to be fascinating to see over the next five, six, seven years. Who can carry a franchise? Is it going to be a Robert Pattinson? Who's going to, who is James Gunn going to get for Superman? That's going to be extremely fascinating. Okay. Because that being said, they've, I mean, Daisy Ridley, I mean, I, she's a young lady, but nobody knew her before any of, nobody could, I, at least me personally, I could not name one film she was in before Star Wars. That's not to say I, I didn't like her. I never heard of her. Okay? She's in those three she, biggest seven, eight years stretch of her life. Then she goes off and she's doing some other films. But that's it. It's really going to be interesting to see who steps up over the course of five, six, seven years. And can they sustain it? Because if they do, they can have a long, illustrious career like a Harrison Ford, okay, and carry a couple of franchises. And the other thing that was brought up in the piece, and he's right about it too, is you have streaming today. So you may have two. I mean, look at Pedro Pascal, right? Pedro Pascal is about the only other actor I can think of off the top of my head that can do this. He could carry two franchises, okay? The Mandalorian, Star Wars, and The Last of Us. That's it. That's the only other guy I can think of off the top of my head. I mean, he's not he's not a movie star. He's hot right now because he has that. But it's not like you see his face like a Harrison Ford, like an Arnold Schwarzenegger, like a you know a Nicolas Cage and John Travolta, like these guys. So it's really interesting to see who's going to be able to do this. Um, anyways, guys, what do you think about that piece? Do you think we are just completely out of action stars today in Hollywood? And if not, who are some of the people that you watch? Do you think Tom Cruise is the last movie star? Leave me your thoughts down in the comments and I'll get back there. Okay, so um, we move from one. Uh, we move from one franchise to another, and this is actually interesting news. So, anybody who, um, bear with me, guys. Um, anybody who has seen or played these games okay knows that 
this whole thing started back in the 90s with Midway and really changed how we view video games because this was the first video game that really was violent. I mean, yeah, we were Doom, but that came later and, and everything else. But Mortal Kombat was the first major video game that really so whenever you go to a buy your video games okay unless you get them digitally and even then okay there's something a little something called the esrb the electronic safety rating board it's kind of like the mpa for films but this is for video games and basically what they do is they look at the finished product before it's put out and marketed and say okay is this something that a kid could play? And so Mortal Kombat and Midway changed the game for a lot, literally and figuratively, for a lot of different reasons. So as everybody knows, okay, in the past, over the past couple of years, we've had another reiteration of Mortal Kombat. I saw it in theaters. It was okay. I mean, it was definitely a different take on it. But um, so anyways, they are going to make a sequel. And this actress here, okay, is going to be playing Jade. Okay, she is in final talks right now to be playing Jade for the sequel. So her name is Tati Gabrielle. And so this comes from us. This comes from the uh, THR. Tati Gabrielle, known for her work in the Netflix series You, as well as The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, is in final negotiations to join the fifth flying cast of New Line sequel to 2021's Mortal Kombat. Simon McQuaid, who directed the previous movie based on the video game, is back behind the joystick for the second installment, with Jeremy Slater writing the screenplay for the sequel. The sequel continues the story of a group of ragtag fighters first in the ways of martial arts, who defend our reality, which is known as an Earth realm, against the outworld. The first movie, released during the pandemic in both theaters and on HBO Max, remains one of the streamer's biggest hits to date. Carl Urban is already on board to play fan-favorite Johnny Cage, an action movie star who enters the Mortal Kombat tournament in order to prove he, to the naysayers he is able to do his own stunts. Gabrielle will play Jade, a heroine first seen in Mortal Kombat 2. That was the picture I was showing you here. Um, the first video game series that thrust into the 90s pop mainstream. Jade is an assassin who is a body who is a friend and bodyguard to the character known as Princess Katana. It is expected that some of the first movie's cast, such as Jessica Naimi and Josh Larson, Josh Larson will return. Producing are Atomic Monsters James Wan and Michael Clear and Broken Producers, Broken Road Producers Todd Garner. McQuaid and E. Bennett Walsh are also producing. Gabrielle has seen her character become a significant role over the course of several seasons of You, Netflix's hot button stalker show that is now in its fourth season. She first garnered notice for her work on The 100, but gained a following for playing Prudence on Sabrina. She also voiced Willow on the Disney's The Owl House. On the feature side, she's also appeared to Tom Holland and Mark Wahlberg in Sony's Uncharted. Okay, so I think that this is good news. That I think, you know, that we have an upcoming actress, okay, in her, that, first of all, she's beautiful. So I think that that's already something. I The mask, I mean... The mask is going to be secondary, but I think that this is going to, um, this is, I mean, she's beautiful. So, I mean, I think that's going to really do wonders for her. That being said, I think that this is going to be something that I, I got to be honest, I'm looking forward to. Okay. It was a different iteration of the character. Okay. Everybody remembers the, the campy, you know, the campy, I think it was 1995, 1996 film. And then, I mean, she wasn't in that one, but, you know, she was in Annihilation. 
Oh, okay. We won't talk about that. So I, I think it's going to be a little different there. But nonetheless, I think this is going to be good. Um, I think, obviously, this is going to be a wait and see type of thing because, of course, you know, the WGA and, you know, you've got SAG now and everything. So with the writer's strike, all this stuff's going to get pushed back. So in a couple of years, okay, we're probably not, they're probably not going to start filming this until 2025, okay, with pre production and everything else. Um, maybe mid 2024. I'm just guessing. That being said, I'm interested. I'm interested because I am really wanting to see more characters and who they're going to get for this. Um, and how are they going to apply this? I mean, is it going to be the same principle where she falls in, you know, so in Mortal Kombat, okay, Princess Katana falls in love with, uh, in the original 95 version, she falls in love with, uh, Liu Kang. Are they going to do the same thing here? Except, you know, I could see like a love triangle type of thing. That would be an interesting dynamic. I mean, the first one was rated R, after all, right? So I think they could do something like that. That's just me, personally. Um, I don't know, though. I, I think it would be a fascinating um, a fascinating thing. But I do think, like I said, the whole... We have an, we have an up-and-coming movie. We have an up-and-coming star in this movie. We have Carl Urban... Okay, he's one of those actors that is, a, I mean, look, he can carry his own movie. I mean, we've we've seen that with Dread, right? Even though that wasn't the greatest remake in the world, he can still do that. And now you're going to have, you know, some of the other ones. It's going to be a fascinating dynamic. And who's the villain going to be? What are they going to do for Shang Tsung? Or, you know. How are they going to do that? That's going to be a fascinating thing, though. Anyways, guys, what do you think about the character casting for this? Are you, do you like this idea of her coming in? Or do, would you rather go get somebody else? If so, who would you get? Who would you like, to, who else besides Johnny Cage and Jade would you like to see in this iteration of Mortal Kombat coming up? Leave me your thoughts down in the comments and I'll get back to everybody. Okay, so the last story of the day is about a show that um, is going to finally be coming out that um, we've been waiting a long time for. Excuse me, guys. Can only put so many slides up at once. Um uh, so, so basically, this is a show that we have been waiting for for a long time. And it finally got a release date. And it, um, it basically, it, it, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with it when it does come out. So... Just bear with me for just two seconds, and here we go. Okay, I'm ready. So, so this is a, this is a series that we've always talked about, and it's been interesting. And it's Loki. Loki is one of those series that was very well received by a lot of people. Um, I think Tom Hiddleston's character was, I mean, everybody loves Loki in some capacity because whether he's a comedic guy or he's a villain in the Avengers or he's a comedic guy in Thor, Love, and Rag Thor Ragnarok or whatever, everybody loves Loki, okay? And so we, excuse me, we finally have some, um, we finally have a release date for it, but there's an interesting twist to this. Okay, so this comes to us from Screen Rant, okay, and it says, Loki Season 2 trailer shown 
by Disney does not include Jonathan Majors or Kang. During Disney's upfront this week, Marvel Studios, <clears throat> excuse me, screened the Loki season two trailer. However, neither Jonathan Majors nor Kang appeared in it, despite being a central villain. Majors was te- was teed up to be the major the main villain of Loki season two in the Ant Man and Wasp Quantum Mania post credit scene. So everybody remembers that was this scene here, um, which fe- which featured uh, Loki and Morbius Owen Wilson in a crowd show featuring Kang's variant Victor Timely. After Quantum Mania. After Quantum Mania's release in February, Majors was arrested in New York City in late March on charges of strangulation, assault, and harassment. At Disney's upfront presentation to press and advertisers on May 16th, Marvel Studios head Kevin Feige previewed a handful of the Marvel Cinematic's upcoming shows, including Secret Invasion, which, by the way, guys, we will be covering here on the channel. That does start mid-June. We'll, we will figure it out. Um so we're, we're definitely going to be covering that, though. Echo and Loki Season 2. According to AXO, Tim reporter Bay Singer, Tim Bainsinger, Feige made no mention of Majors being in the show, nor did any of his characters, Kang or Victor Timely, appear in the Loki 2 Season, tra- season 2 trailer. The trailer has not, has not been released online, but Feige did confirm the MCU show will return later this year. Loki Season 2 is set to premiere Friday, August 6th, shifting from Wednesdays to Fridays. Neither Marvel nor Feige has commented on Major's arrest yet, though fan speculation has run rampant whether the studio will or should recast the role of Kang. Deadline reported in April that Marvel has zero has had zero discussions about recasting Majors. It's likely that Marvel is waiting to see how Major's case progresses before have, making before having any discussions, let alone making any decisions. After all, it was only after Johnny Depp lost his liberal case against his son, in which he was ruled um, the paper was truthful when they called him a wife beater, that he was asked to resign from the Fantastic Beasts franchise. Since Loki Season 2 is finished filming and has a release date, it doesn't appear, though, that Marvel has any intention of altering the show, no matter what happens with Major's case. As a result... It's possible they'll go the same route that they did with previewing Loki season two with Disney's upfront and skirt around the issue of the actor being a major villain. When it's released, the Loki season two trailer will likely avoid including majors as Kang or Timely. It's possible this is meant to avoid spoilers, either for the show or Quantum Majors postseason. Um, but given Majors' arrest, his lack of appearance is notable. After Loki, the next known appearance of Kang of Mater's Kang is 2025's at Kang Dynasty. At the moment, it appears that Marvel is staying the course with Mater's playing Kang. However, if the actor is found guilty of the charges he's facing, the studio will have to reevaluate how to proceed. Until then, it remains to be seen how the Loki Season 2 trailer will handle his major involvement when it releases online. Okay, a couple things. <clears throat> Number one. <sighs> They are in a, Marvel is in a no-win situation here, okay? Let's just call, let's just call this what it is. They are in a no-win situation because, so his next court date, I believe, is June 9th, okay? You don't quote me on that. Um, it is going to... I, it's either June 9th, it's the first week in June. I do that, know that. Okay, it is the 5th through the 9th. So that I do know for a fact because that's just public record. Okay, that being said, they are in a no win situation. Okay, because if they turn around and obviously they have to see and wait, if because of the Johnny Depp situation, if they recast them now, Okay. Um, then, if he is found to have done nothing wrong, he lost out on a huge. Forget about the, the the court of public opinion for a minute. Forget about that. I'm talking about the role. Johnny Depp 
had two major franchises, okay? Pirates of the Caribbean and Fantastic Beasts. And he lost out on both of them, okay? If it's found that Majors did nothing wrong, okay, and this is, you know, I mean, that's why we go through due process, okay? If it's found that he did nothing wrong, then everybody, you know, continues on the way. If he has, if he is guilty, they are going to have to really do some soul searching. Because at that point, what's going to end up happening is that excuse me, um, they're going to have to make a short list very, very quickly. Um, that being said, I, it, you look, if you recast him now, because here's the thing, this writer's strike, believe it or not, is a blessing in disguise for them because they can actually put this off. Now, this is coming out in October. Okay, so we will know more in June, but here's the thing. I think that, you know, people are going to forget about it, and they have forgotten about it. Don't forget, guys, this whole arrest happened in March. We're, we're two months out from this. People have forgotten about John the Majors, okay? People have forgotten about John the Majors. The only time Majors came up is when he went to court, and they stayed at, you know, they stayed it, got an extension, and that was we're going to go back in a couple of weeks. Um, but that being said, there is one good thing about this, and it's this: anybody who has seen Quant, uh, I mean, and watched Quantum Mania, and you know has seen the post credit scenes. I'm not going to spoil them. You know what they are. You, it's like Doctor Who that you can interchange them one for the other, so it doesn't matter. Okay. I think the fact that, you know, you're able to do that is fantastic for them, okay? They're, you're not going to have the same gravitas, though, okay? No matter who you get, because they have to have a physical appearance about them. Um, look, it's going to get released in October. There's going to be, we're, we are not going to talk about this. And I say we, I mean, everybody's not going to talk about this from um may to october that's it until the trailer drops when the trailer drops in probably september okay then and you don't see him and you know it's interesting that they noted in the article that you're not even going to see kang anywhere in the trailer so <laughs> i mean my guess is this you are not going to because don't forget two things number one they're probably gonna have to push kang dynasty back i mean right now it has a 2025 release date i want to say it's yeah i i yeah it's a i believe it's a may i believe it's a may 2025 uh release date okay um that being said you're probably going to have to push that back just because they did fire, believe it or not. Okay. They did fire the writer at May, May 2nd, 2025. That is the original release date. Um, you got to figure it's going to take at least six months for pr principal photography, another six months for post. Okay. Um, you know, so you're talking about a year. So he is going to have to start make up. You don't have to do it all the time. I mean, look, you can do what they did with Dinos, okay, and have him having one particular film, and then not have him in four or five films. Reference him, sure, okay, whether it's by name or, or otherwise, and then have him make one other appearance until Kang Dynasty, in which case he becomes more of a presence. Um, I don't know what they do. Excuse me. I don't know what they do. I think that they have to, 
they have to start doing something with it. Because otherwise, what's going to end up happening is this is going to hang over their head. And this is going to hang over their head. And I think that if it does, Kang Dynasty is, you know, it's not going to be as good as it, is. it could have been. You know, I mean, but they have to find the right actor for it. I don't know. I think this is a wait and see type of thing. Once we get the trailer at the end of the summer, and we will, and probably around August or September, then we'll talk more about it then. But, you know, and, and we're going to know more in June. We're going to know more in a couple weeks, guys, because here's the thing. He's either going to plead out, okay, and be done, or that's it. And that's it. So the, the sooner this gets resolved, the better. And I think that, you know, it's just a matter of time. So regardless, so I have no doubt they're going to get the right person for the job. And I think he will carry the same gravitas and the same um, physical, you know, type of uh, being. So anyways, guys, what do you think about Jonathan Majors not even being in the trailer for Loki season Loki 2? He's in about a half the show. We know that for a fact because that's been stated. What do you think Marvel's going to do? Are they going to wait or until June and then start to move forward? What do you think they should cut him loose now and say, that's it? I don't want to deal with it. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments and I'll get back to everybody. Okay. So that's going to wrap it up for today's show. Um, this, you know, a lot of stuff here, a lot of interesting stuff, you know, from not only, you know, cans, but, you know, uh, Fast X and all that good stuff. Um, so a couple things. Number one, I have not, I know it's, we're quickly approaching June. <laughs> I've not forgotten about the uh, Patreon guys. I just, I've been trying to put these podcasts up and whatnot. So um, <clears throat> I will be getting these, I will be getting them done. Um, I have to, I will just, I, I was waiting. I was trying to find somewhere to watch train day. I will just, I will just do it. Okay. Um, because I've seen it so many times that I have it ingrained in my memory. So that being said, I will be recording the untouchables and, um, training day for the Patreon in the next couple of days. Speaking of the Patreon, there's a couple of ways, like it says in the bottom, you can support me. One is a Patreon. There is two levels. One is five dollars, and one is ten dollars. Five dollars gets you Mob Mondays. That's every single month. I'm gonna be doing one Mob movie that, you know, talking about it, dissecting it, giving my opinions, everything else. That is five dollars. This month, you guys have chosen the Untouchables, the Brian De Palma uh, movie, which I think is his master class. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'll be doing that. And then for rewatch Wednesdays, and that's $10 a month, you get both videos. And, um, so with that, you're going to be getting rewatch Wednesdays, which is essentially films I've seen that I haven't seen in a while. You guys have touched on that. As I said, it's training day. You guys selected that for me. So that's going to be there. Number two, uh, super chats. If you guys come in, you really like what you're seeing you're hearing, I love, you know, I, any super chats I get would be much appreciated. Um, and, you know, that would be fantastic. I am trying to grow this, this channel um, and get this out to as many people as I can. Guys, if you like what you're seeing, hit that like and subscribe button. Okay. I can't reiterate that enough because this is, um, this is what I want to do. Um, Number three, uh, I am podcast. I am putting up podcasts, three or four podcasts on a daily basis. Like I said, go to your favorite podcasting site, okay? Spotify, Apple, iHeart. Search Real Talk. Search for that picture there, and you'll be able to listen to all of these shows. If you can't see them, you know, you're at the gym or you're out, you know, walking the dog or you're grocery shopping, guys. 
putting up all the shows for you guys. The video shows, of course, if you have time, sit down, take an hour, sit down and watch the show. Um, but hit that like and subscribe button uh, because, you know, number three, the store. I have a ton of, we have Father's Day coming up, guys, okay? T-shirts, mugs, sweatshirts, hoodies, all that good stuff. Go to the store there. Anything you get will be a, uh, will help me out. And it will be, you know, not only will it help me out, you guys send me a picture, okay, via social media. I will make sure to put it on the on the show for you and um, to spread the word about it. The other thing about it, um, the Mission Impossible Rewatch series. As I've said at the top of the show, I'll say it now. I'm going to be sitting down and watching Mission Impossible 3 very, very soon and recording that by July 12th. All of the Mission Impossibles I will have watched and recorded and will lead up to Ted Reckoning. Perfect movies. Perfect movies. We've been doing it for six months now, almost. Um, we've done Silence of the Lambs, Captain America Winter Soldier, Heat, The Social Network, you know, all of these films. I'm going to be doing The Dark Knight for June. So, yeah. And that's about it. So, okay. So, guys, do the three things you need to do. Be safe, be careful, and have a great rest of the day. And I am David Steele, and you have been watching Real Talks. Bye-bye, guys.